Movement stronger than before. Thank you for being a part of Denver's story. Welcome Denver Startup Week. Hello, hello, hello. Um, couldn't be more excited uh, for this session. Um, hopefully you've had a chance as an attendee to soak in one or two or 10 or dozens of over the 235 free sessions with this year's 100% virtual Denver Startup Week. I'm Eric Matisic. I'm the president and CEO of a software company called Highwing and co-founder of Denver Startup Week and couldn't be more excited uh, to introduce this uh, key light, uh, keynote session and spotlight panel uh, between Imran Khan and Ryan Heckman uh, to really cap off an amazing week. At Denver Startup Week, we work tirelessly, as Tammy mentioned in her video, to bring visionaries to life, to allow you to really engage in the most current uh, technology trends, uh, elements around leadership, but most importantly, how do they convert really big ideas to action to really move the world? Today, our two speakers couldn't be more <clears throat> suited for this discussion. So to, to, without further ado, I'd love to introduce them and I'll turn it over to Ryan Heckman to moderate this keynote session. So Imran Khan, for those of you who do not know him, is the co-founder and chief executive offer of Verishop, an e-commerce company with the mission of bringing online shopping back to life. By merging industry leading tech and retail, Verishop aims to be nimble and innovative in creating an ever evolving shopping destination that both shoppers and brands can count on. Prior to founding Verishop, Imran served as Snap Inc's, AKA Snapchat's chief strategy officer, where he oversaw the company's corporate strategy, revenue generation, and most importantly, took the company from a zero revenue run rate to over $1.6 billion in sales in less than four years. Prior to that, he was the head of global internet investment banking at Credit Suisse, where he advised on over $45 billion worth of internet and M&A financing transactions. Previous, he was the managing director and head of internet and global research at J.P. Morgan Chase, and he's a proud pioneer hailing from the University of Denver right here in our city. The session today is going to be moderated by a fellow financier and Olympian, Ryan Heckman, a 20-year private equity operator and investor who most recently acquired and served as CEO of EVP Eye Care, a Denver-based surgical eye care company, which he grew the company from $1 million in EBITDA to over 13.3 million, and he sold in the transaction for over $150 million in just a few years. Prior to EVP, he co-founded Exelier Partners and co-managed a top decile performing middle market form uh, fund uh, in, in private equity. Prior to Exelier, Mr. Heckman was a principal at KRG and Booth Creek Capital Management, and he's also the chairman of Civico, a Denver-based community leadership development organization focused on empowering entrepreneurs, senior executives, and founders and community leaders to reach their maximum potential. Ryan currently is the managing partner of a new private equity fund, Rally Day Partners, investing in leading entrepreneurs around the world. He serves on the board of trustees at the University of Denver, helping pioneers every single day. And most importantly, everything he approaches is with his Olympian zeal and flair, having gone to the Olympics in both 1992 and 1994. Today's session should be energetic. It should be filled with insights around leadership, uh, innovation, and most importantly, learning to start up. And I can't wait for these two titans to be able to, uh, to introduce these two titans to our Denver Startup Week community for you to enjoy for the next hour. Thank you so much for attending Denver Startup Week. We hope you enjoy the last two, two days and all the sessions ahead. But most importantly, enjoy the next hour with these two incredible speakers. Ryan? Hi, everyone. Tammy Dorr. President and CEO of the Downtown Denver Tech Partnership and co-founder of Denver Startup Week. I'm doing a Tamio cameo because we want to say a special thank you to Ryan Heckman. We're coming to you live today from the Commons on Champa. And many of you may not know that Ryan Heckman was the initial investor in this important entrepreneurial space. So a big shout out to Ryan Heckman and a big thank you. Now I'll give it back. Thanks, Tammy. What she didn't tell you is right before I got on, she said, Ryan, don't F it up. And she actually used the word. So be careful, this lady. Uh, Imran, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you in the flesh. Um, uh, Tammy has a crush on you, by the way, and I have a man crush on you. Um, so let's just get because that out of the way. Um, 
I also kind of hate you because you've been so successful and so significant. Um, and I'm a little jelly of all of your accomplishments. I wish um, I was an Olympian. Before we get started, um, though, I wanted to ask you for three kind of guidelines for our conversation. Um, and we only have like 45 minutes, so I wanted to make sure the folks that are watching this get the most out of this interaction as possible. So first of all, um, I'm asking you to be really vulnerable, which for you probably means you don't want to give yourself any credit and you don't want to uh, look or act too cool. So we're inviting you to have a strong ego today um, without having to be too humble. Two, let's go right into real talk. One of my friends uses that word all the time. And it's a little uncomfortable because we're on TV and all that stuff, but let's just get after it and pretend we're having a beer, or a glass of wine at dinner and Let's enjoy this conversation. Um, and then three, let's remember our audience, which are entrepreneurs that um, probably in, in one day feel awesome and then in the same day feel uh, terribly frightened and scared and, and everything in between. And let's try to speak to that audience uh, as opposed to maybe some of your other stakeholders or, or people in our worlds collectively. Um, so cool with you, that's good. Great. Uh, well, Imran, if you don't mind, um, you know, the first time your name came up to me with Eric Matisic, he talked to me about you for about an hour. Uh, super annoying, um, but incredible journey you've been on. Um, would you take us back to Bangladesh before you came to the University of Denver and talk a little bit about how your heritage um, has shaped you, both good and bad? Yeah. So um, I grew up in Bangladesh. Um, I went to high school there, and uh, and I always wanted to come to the United States. You know, watch U.S. movies, watch uh, uh, a lot of U.S. shows, and listen to the U.S. music. You know, first uh, uh, in English music I heard was from Eagles, uh, and uh, really, really, I still to date I love Eagles, and. Uh, so I wanted to come to the U.S. and you know, and in mid '90s, you know, uh, I we didn't have internet in our home, uh, so I went to uh, magazine stores and picked up U.S. news, and looked at all the schools and randomly wrote letters to a bunch of the schools saying that, hey, I want to come. What do I need to do? So University of Denver uh, sent me a bro very nice brochure. So guys who work on brochure, brochure matters. And you know what really excited me about that they were talking about how more than 300 days of sunny days and the campus looked beautiful. So anyway, uh, long story short, um, uh, I, I got a, uh, got into DU, uh, I got the US visa, showed up, and uh, and and at that time I met Eric Mitizik. So first of all, in Denver, I made uh, made some lifelong friends uh, who are still my friends, uh, and and it's a wonderful experience. And and help me, uh, you know, pursue the next thing. What I did, you know, move to Wall Street uh, in research and banking. Well, that's a good segue because I was going to sort of like ask you if you could just go through the major chapters of your life. Um, at least for me, I look at things in kind of five to seven year increments, and I'm wondering, as you look, uh, I think you graduated from DU in 2000, right? Um, but if there were three to five major chapters of your life. How would you characterize those and give us a little color for uh, for where you've uh, been and where you are today? Yeah, you know, you know, I think one of the thing um, I have done in my life is that I continue to take risk, you know, uh, and, you know, and look, I, I would not uh, overhype it. I took risk with a with a reasonable understanding what could be potential downside. But but I did take risk, and 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 in each of this chapter defines very different risk, right? So growing up in Bangladesh, I was very sheltered, you know, uh, and 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 very lovely parents, and you know, wonderful parents, and very lucky to have parents like them, and uh, and then coming to the U.S., you know, was a big risk. You know, I I was not comfortable, you know. I've never been to the U.S. You know, for the first time, I landed to Denver International Airport. You know, blew my mind how wide the streets are, roads are. Right? You know, in Bangladesh, everything is very tiny, and you just land and look at that Denver International Airport. What 
uh, what they built is it's 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 still I was kind of shocked that the roads can be that big, uh, and uh, and then meeting friends and for the first time and people like Eric or Kyle who you know Kyle is a you know I grew up in Dhaka, Bangladesh, should have ten million people. Kyle grew up in a small town in Colorado, had two thousand people. Uh, no matter not only the very different part of the world, but very different cultural point of view. So I think that that was a risk, you know, and 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 look, at first year was tough, you know. Uh there's a, you know, I think I'll, I'll give you a very one little cultural nuances. Uh, in 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 Bangladesh, when people talk to each other, they have to speak very closely, you know, but in America, we like to keep a separate distance, you know. Uh, now even more now that you have COVID, but even before COVID, you, you know, have a little bit distance, and and that's you know that culture, that little bit nuanced cultural thing. You know, uh, I would go close to my friends, and they would walk back from me. You know, <laughs> like you know things like that. Uh, but it was great. And, By the way, and, I do that. I, I do that with Eric Matisic sometimes. <laughs> uh, Eric doesn't like it. Uh, so anyway, uh, but made wonderful friends, and and couldn't be happier. It's it's you know, I. You know, I know we're living in a very interesting time, but America is still the greatest country in the world. You know, greatest country, greatest nation with an incredible human being. And uh, so, so, and they really embraced me. So I'm very, very thoughtful and, and it's a country you can do anything. Uh, so from there, you know, I think the next chapter was, you know, I got exposed to uh, Wall Street through uh, uh, a friend of ours uh, who a couple of years older went to Wall Street. and. And, and, and it sounded really cool and taking finance classes uh, at DU, it, you know, I didn't know anything about finance. I didn't know what Wall Street was, but, you know, I thought that sounded exciting and, and wanted to move to New York. New York looked exciting. So that was, a, I would say, third risk. You know, Denver to New York is very different, you know, and, 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 and Wall Street hours were very different. And, uh, but I think, you know, I think the key thing is, you know, again, I think the big thing is, it is a country where you can work really hard, and if you, you know, uh, you know, look, nothing is guaranteed. But if you, if you're reasonably lucky and you work really hard, and, and and you're fair to people, people help you. And I've been blessed by a lot of people helping me, and and met a lot of great people who took a chance on me. Uh, so so anyway, so I was a research analyst. I was one of the top ranked research analysts in Wall Street, covering internet for a long period of time at J.P. Morgan. And then you know, uh, I met these guys at Alibaba in 2004, you know, in 2009, they, or 10, took, took, they took a chance on me and they asked me to be a, their banker. So I moved to banking and helped them do all the transactions. So I helped Alibaba buy back share from Yahoo. You know, Yahoo owned 20% of, 40% uh, of their share. We bought back half of them. Uh, I did all the financing, made a $50 million investment on Alibaba at $18, you know, that generated quarter billion dollar profit for Credit Suisse. And uh, so it was a great run. So that was, I would say, fourth chapter. And then as, uh, so I was very successful. And then I took another risk and Evan called me, uh, was a founder of Snapchat and he wanted to take a chance on me. You know, he heard of me and I, I really liked him. We get along very well and get along very well to date. And he took a chance on me and I took a risk. And so I went to Snapchat. And so again, when we went, it was a pre-IPO, so pre-revenue company. Uh, so we took the business from zero to, you know, a couple of billion dollar business. Uh, uh, the company went public and then, you know, I wanted to feel like, you know, so I was a research analyst, I was a banker, I operated a business, but now I wanted to see if I can build something from ground zero, you know, uh, and uh, so so that's the next risk, you know, so I'm probably, uh, you know, to a degree in a similar shoes as many people, the company is only two years old, we're doing really, really well, our business is growing very nice, and we have, a, but, you know, we still have a lot to prove, uh, and so some days are good, some days are bad, like any entrepreneur. Yeah, as a fellow recovering or recovered money guy who also took the leap to entrepreneurship after, I would say, riding in the back seat and, uh, you know, doing all the capital market stuff, I found that leap to entrepreneurship uh, romantic and, and wonderful for about a day. Uh, and then it was just humbling every single day. Uh, and it, it was the most formative time of my life. I did it for about five years. Um, why don't you walk us through um, these two kind of distinct phases? In phase one, I think some of the learning people might enjoy is hearing 
what you learned about leadership of these titans and you know i, I appreciate that eric called you and i titans we're, we're car- hardly in that uh uh league yet uh but evan certainly is and jamie diamond certainly is and some of the other folks that you've had the privilege of serving um, in executive roles. Can you give us a little riff on just what you learned from uh, all these very uh, significant leaders uh, during your journey that you are now using uh, as either inspiration or wisdom uh, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think I would go a little bit bigger, you know, more than entrepreneur. I think, you know, there are many paths to be successful in life, right? And, uh, and, 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 and success, you know, could be defined as what you think is a success, you know, or the second way the success could be defined is what, uh, what society think is a success, you know? Uh, So, I don't necessarily be believer that you know somebody is successful because society thinks that they're successful. I think somebody is successful what they wanted to do in with their life, and if they do it and they're happy about it, they are successful. I'm a big believer of that, you know, because otherwise, you know, everybody chase what other people say. You know, I think people should do. It's your life, you know. You get to come to the world once, you know, at least to my belief. And you should live the life that you want to live and what makes you happy. And living every day happy is the single most important thing. So saying that, let's talk about what society thinks is success. You know, that means you have a big job or you, you know, you, you, or you change the world or you did these things. You know, well, I would argue that everybody make a change the world every day with the small things that we do. But let's look at, focus on quote unquote, how society or media would think that you are successful. You know, I think, uh, on that, I think the most important thing is, you know, do what makes you happy, you know, because I think if you are not, you know, the, all the people, successful people I met, I think one of the most common thread is they really enjoy what they do. They love it. They crave it. They don't do it for money. They don't do it for fame. You know, yes, those things is, help them to go forward, but they do it because they truly, truly love it. And they truly, truly have a passion for it, you know. Uh, you know, that is the first derivative that they do it for, you know. Uh, the second thing is uh, they have uh, incredible conviction and faith on their belief system. You know, Nasir don't, you know, I think the biggest thing is that when you make changes and when you do things, the biggest thing is that there's so many people constantly telling you you are wrong, you know. You know, nine, the, the, by definition of a success is 99% people don't believe, you know, it's going to be possible. So, so, so I think the, the second thing is that really, really important to appreciate that, you know, you are comfortable failing and you are doing it, it's really, really fun. And you have the conviction that what you are doing is the right way to do, you know, because most people just give up. Right, you know, when things get tough, most people can give up. So if you are comfortable, you know, this is the question that I ask, and this is a question I ask myself. You know, all the chapters, right? When I moved from research at the top of my research career to banking, and from a banking top of the banking career to Snap, and from a Snap, you know, I had an incredibly cushy job to move to startup again. You know, back going back to the grinding again. You know, I ask myself the same single question, and I that I learned from others. You know, that am I comfortable of failing? You know. And if you're comfortable with failing and then you're comfortable with your conviction that, hey, uh, I love it. I want to do it. I want to give it a shot. Yes, 99% of the people say it's not can be doable, but I'll do it. And that is, I, I, think, the, I think, the big, big, most um, important thing. And then the third thing I think, I think is really, really important is that, you know, one individual cannot do everything. You need a team. You know, uh, you can be superstar, but you still need a team. You need a support system in your life to be successful you know the single most important decision you can make who you're going to marry you know you know because in life your partner is very very important you're not going to be successful if you make decisions poor decisions on partner and if you if you, so i think the so what i i what i've seen that the people who have been incredibly successful is you know again on the point of view from society is really really uh, have that incredible ability to surround themselves with great people and have the ability to great people to 
have a belief, have, have a faith on them, you know, and, and they create a follower. And, and if you can do those three things, those are the three interesting trademark of people who, you know, quote unquote, became successful that, you know, uh, they love what they do. They have incredible passion for it. Number two, they have a high degree of conviction, you know, that what they do, they believe in themselves, that they can noise out the rest of the people who are telling them that they're wrong. Uh, and then the third thing is they have the ability to gen create a followers who actually believe in this human being and, 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 and inspire people to join them. And, 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 and that makes you know, them incredibly successful. It's worth underlining. I mean, it's almost a formula that you just laid out because if you really love what you do and you have a lot of faith in what you're doing, uh, followers tend to follow, right? And uh, I think that's a really elegant uh, way of describing uh, success in so many ways, especially as entrepreneurs, because sometimes you can't pay people what they're worth. Uh, you're trying to convince them of uh, maybe some equity instead of current compensation and a lot of sacrifices that entrepreneurs and their followers have to make at home with the late hours and the weekends and everything in between. And if you don't have that happy factor and you as a leader don't have that conviction, it's going to be tough to recruit that A team that you're probably not paying like an A team, at least in current compensation. So what a cool, um, I think good, uh, takeaway for all of us. Um, and thank you for that, Imran. That's really cool. Um, segwaying just a little bit. Uh, so I'm imagining you, imagining you at some really nice office at Snapchat's headquarters, a couple ping pong tables, sweet office, um, and on top of the world after the IPO. Um, was there a moment or a, an event uh, that you could share with us when you said, okay, I've been working my ass off. I got to the top here. What I really want to do is go work like 80 hours a week, not pay myself any money, put my ass on the line and start all over and become an entrepreneur. I mean, was there, I'm picturing you walking on a beach or in a mountain or something like, can you just share with us what your moment of inception was um, when you decided, yeah, I really want to go put myself in the hurt locker. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I like to torture myself. Uh, and, uh, and when things go too smoothly, I get too bored, you know. So uh, I find the excitement when there is a volatility, you know. And, uh, and I always tell my partners, like we hired some wonderful people who's working at Veroshop, you know. Uh, you know, my CTO came from, you know, pre IP employee at Snapchat, Facebook, Square. Uh, you know, my chief logistic officer came for tar tar Target. And I always tell people that my long term, you know, you know, I don't want to be the CEO of Veroshop all my life, you know, because there will be a time that the job potentially, if you are successful, you know, it will get cushy. And, you know, and, and there are people and it'll become all about optimization, you know. You know, you, at some point you go from thinking exponentially to op optimization, and 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 uh, and and you know, after four years at Snap, you know, we took the business to a level that we set the framework that it became about optimization, right? And that's you know, not something I excites me, and that's not something uh, I'm probably the best at the world anyway, you know, uh, because I don't have a passion for you know incrementalism. I like to think, you know, how can we have exponential improvement? And, uh, and, uh, and that just, you know, excites me. And as I looked around the world, you know, I realized that the starting point, and, and if you guys have the Apple phone, please download our app, you know, that'll become more, uh, more, make more sense what I'm about to say, because if you look at Verishop website, it's not so obvious. If you go to the app, it will start making sense what we're building. But, uh, what the, the what I realized that the starting point on the web uh, of how people start on the internet is changing, right? So if you think think about it, twenty five years ago or twenty years ago, the starting point of the internet was search, right? So you had this big web browser, you show up on your desktop, and it's like, what do I do? Okay, let's search for something, you know, and and you start searching, and that's how you found the product. That's how like you 
bought Amazon or that's how you went to Expedia, bought a plane ticket. It's all about search. Or you go to YouTube and you search for a video. It's all about search base. But if you look at with the growth of smartphone, you know, the starting point of the internet is now becoming barbell is a big part of the starting point of the internet is browsing, right? So you go to Instagram or Snapchat to browse, you know, so you go to Snapchat to browse a friend, you go to Instagram to browse an influencer, you go to TikTok to browse an entertainer, you go to Spotify to browse the music. So that happening. But that's not how the shopping works. You know, shopping, you know, actually all live shopping and you go to the shopping mall, shopping mall is all about browsing and discovery and inspiring and that purchase. You know, but in e-commerce in the US became all about search and getting the product and out, you know, but I, we think that as the starting point of the internet is changing to from search to browse base and discovery base and inspiration base, that was an opportunity to create a, this browse based e-commerce experience where you have the uh, discovery inspiration that married with the ease of shopping that Amazon has built. And, and when we think, I, and, you know, and I thought that is a huge opportunity and it's a great way, you know, as there's a democratization of retail happening, you know, because if you think about it, you know, one of the things that social media did, they democratized the talent pool, right? The Hollywood was this place where you can be talent and you'd get paid a lot of money, but, you know, in a way, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, they democratized the talent pool, right? So now you can find very entertaining person on Instagram, and TikTok and other places. And I think that same thing is happening in commerce. There's a lot of fragmentation of brand is happening. People are building these cool brands, right? But how do you discover this brand if you don't know them? You cannot search for them. So, so that's what we're trying to do is how can you democratize the retail and help people discover new cool brand with the ease of shopping? And and then we thought that was that would be interesting uh, uh, things to try. And and you know we launched the company uh, eighteen months ago. Uh, how long had you been thinking about it, Imran, before it became conviction and faith for you? And then who was the first person you told, you know, verbally, like got it out there and how did that feel to you when you did? Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the interesting thing in life is that, you know, to be honest with you, it's not the day one, how, what you think, because over the time you learn a lot of things, but, you know, I think, um, the first person I told is my wife and, um, and she was working at Amazon, you know, and would talk about, you know, and, and a big online shopper and, 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 I'll, and, 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 do, and we're discussing a lot of the problems, you know, so I don't think, you know, I would claim the idea that I came up with it and when told her it, it, it's a collaboration, collaborative effort. And, and, and we realized that something was broken on the e-commerce, you know, and, and when I left at Snap, I would not necessarily say that I had all the answers how to solve that problem, you know, uh, but we thought that you know e-commerce is a 15% of the market it's going to go to 50% of the market and 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 the reality is if you think about it in last two decades there's no real innovation on e-commerce the most of the innovation happened on the front of logistics and infrastructure but there is no front end consumer experience amazon homepage is not that different than it was 10 years ago you know but look at how world wide web has changed so 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 i had this idea that you know there is an opportunity to uh, we 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 think how people shop, you know. Uh, uh, but I also realized that before we rethink the how people shop, we have to make sure that existing experience is there. You know, this is why I think the e-commerce is such a hard problem to solve because many people and you know now Facebook is trying to create social commerce. You know. And every social companies are thinking about, you know, you know social commerce, you know, that, that's an interesting area. And if you look at market like China, it's a really big business. I think to solve the problem, you're gonna make sure that you solve the commerce problem first, right? When people show up, they find the product and then when they buy product, because when they buy something, they're giving you their money. And when they give you their money, they give you the trust, you can deliver on that trust. So the first 12 months, my goal was to, let's just build a lifestyle shopping destination because the discovery will only gonna help lifestyle related product. If you're buying you know, commodity utility, you don't really care about discovery, you just buy it and look for the cheapest price and out. You know, so it said, let's build this lifestyle shopping destination. And that is what we created in Shop. If you go to the website, it looks like a lifestyle shopping destination. We have fashion, home, beauty, electronics, and things like that. And, uh, and let's make sure they have the best 
customer experience. Our net promoter score is 75. So we created the best customer experience. And now on top of that, we are building this new discovery experience, you know, uh, and that's, you will see when you download the app because discovery is more of an app experience. So, so that's where we are. You know, uh, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of the times, you know, uh, when I start something, I never know how the road will end, you know, and you go figure it out as you go, right? When I, you know, went to banking, I never, so first of all, when I started research analysts, I didn't pick up internet, you know, a year later, I realized, huh, nobody's covering internet. And in 2001, it, when, the, when the world blew up, you know, and, and I picked up in 2002, it felt like an interesting category to pick up and everybody thought that was a dumb move. Uh, and then when I went to banking, you know, I didn't think that I would spend a lot of my time in China, but you know, that how I end up doing it. And obviously it, 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 it was a very uh, great opportunity. And then when I went to Snap, you know, I didn't really knew what to expect. So a lot of the things, you know, you figure out as you go. So same thing, you know, I think, I think the e-commerce experience in the US in next decade will fundamentally change. You know, shopping needs to be fun. Shopping needs to be exciting. And with the ease of shopping and uh, somebody will fundamentally change that. You know, so and we, we are one of them. We're trying to make the changes. And if it if we don't win, there's no one to blame but us. Well, let's talk about the segue from from banking and call it Wall Street to being an entrepreneur for a moment. Um, so emotionally, uh, how have you changed in the last couple of years being an entrepreneur and what what emotional challenges have you had? And then from a skill set standpoint, which is the second part of the question. From a skill set skill set standpoint, what things have you had to kind of learn on the fly that maybe you didn't expect or that you found uh, to be new growth for you uh, as, as as part of your personal journey? Yeah, on the first question, you know, what did I learn? You know, I think I got more comfortable with failing. You know, uh, I think that's the most important thing. You know, uh, and then the second thing is I got more comfortable with uh, that you know, that when things are really, really bad, you know, the good days are ahead of you. You know, a mentor of mine always used to say that, you know, today is bad, tomorrow will be even more difficult, but the day after tomorrow will be beautiful, you know? And so if, you know, if you, if you think you cannot take it anymore, you are probably in tomorrow. You know, so that means that or, if it's, or if it's too beautiful today, you might be in trouble tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, right? if, you, if things are going too well, I get nervous. So, you know, our, our economics professor, at, you know, Robert Melvin at DU would say that the New England farmers get really, really nervous if they have a very good harvest here because the next year famine might be coming. You know, so, so uh, you know, uh, one thing I learned in life that things are not as good as you think, things are not as bad as you think. So when you're feeling the most pain, that is the time to react probably because the most pain, that means the next day will be beautiful. Uh, uh, so uh, in terms of, you know, skill set, look, I think the skill set is, is, is managing a big team, you know, uh, uh, and when I went to Snap, you know, by the time I left, I, I think around a thousand people in my organization. And, and I think, you know, as a leader, you know, you have to, I think the big thing is you always have to ask as a leader, you have to set the example. If you culture bleed from the top, and 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 if you don't do it, don't expect your team to do it. You know, if you you know, so if you're not you know, so the question is really that: Am I playing the exemplary role? You know, life is all about you know. You take on a role, and there is some expectations, and you owe to that expectation. So if you want to be the leader, you know, you have to set the expectations that you lead the life that you want your team to lead it, you know, because if they, if you don't do it, you know, people aren't going to do it. So I think the, the biggest thing is question is that, you know, how can we be a leader that I can inspire the team to really, really, you know, change the way people shop or change the way people, you know, how, how Snapchat can win, you know, uh, or your potentials, you know, fight back against these large, big players. So, so I think, and I think creating that leadership style was a big learning thing. You know, when I was a service provider as a research analyst on giving advice or, or it's an advisor, you don't have to, you, you don't set the examples. You, you are more of a commentator, right? So here you are more of a principle where you have to set the tone. That's a, that's a different mindset. Yeah, I understand that. I, I mean, not to 
uh, talk about my journey, but the, the word I u- learned was the word competency. And when I was uh, even an individual athlete or when I was younger in my career in the finance world, I felt like the word competency meant how good am I at my job? But when you're a leader or a principal, as you say, a business owner, uh, a leader of leaders, uh, competency means how good do you make other people at their jobs? Uh, and, and it's a total shift, as you say, in terms of mindset. Um, and it comes from a place of you need your team to perform really well and you need to help them perform really well or you're not going to be in business tomorrow. And I think it's from uh, a, a place of need, not, not, a, not the, the desire to, to get a new quality under your belt. But I really, actually, I actually that, have a question me. for you. Sorry, Imran. I actually have a question for you. I'm so, the one with all the questions. You no, know, no, but it's, 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 it's now, you know, table changes a little bit. So, so, you know, this is always, I want to know, like how it feels like, right? Because you work so hard to go to Olympic and then you go to Olympic. And at that moment, how it feels like that, you know, all your work, you know, is boils down to that singular moment. How does that feel? You're talking what about at the Olympics? Olympics? Yeah. The yeah, Olympics, yes. As an athlete? Athlete, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny you should bring that up because I was just sharing with someone, if you're in a team sport, you win like half the time. Or, you know, chances are you you, you got a shot at winning most of the time. Um, And when you're an individual athlete, like I was, I was ranked ninth in the world uh, when I finished and I never won. I think the last competition I won was when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, In an individual sport, you learn to lose a lot. Uh, and it just has to do with the fact that it's a very competitive world and there's only one of you and there's a hundred people you're competing against. Um, so that's one interesting takeaway of, uh, on reflection. The second one is the one you bring up, which is we should have a lot of empathy and respect for Olympic athletes because they literally work like four years or three and a half years. And in my sport, it was over in like 10 seconds. Right. And so it's just the ultimate sort of like if you have a bad day or you wake up on the wrong side of the bed or um, you have a cold or, you know, so whatever it is, you know, if you look at the percentage of time between training and practice and performance, it's so out of whack that it can drive you crazy. And for me, it did drive me crazy. I didn't handle it very well, to be totally honest. What I find in the real world that's so different is as an equally big a challenge is that we wake up, every, uh, wake up every day and we have to perform every single day. And the amount of time that we get to practice is, is almost zero. The amount of coaching that we get is almost zero. And so f- f- as a former athlete, I find these uh, two ends of the spectrum uh, super challenging. And I have empathy now for both sides of it. And I think, I think especially as entrepreneurs, and I'm curious, uh, Imran, uh, turning the tables back on you, um, you know, who your truth tellers are, who are your coaches? Um, because the entrepreneurial journey is so lonely because your ass is on the line every single day and there aren't a lot of people that can give you constructive help. Um, so in your life, especially now that you're, on the good side of things and not a banker on Wall Street, like who are your truth tellers and who are the people coaching you up? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting question. You know, if people don't live your life, it's very hard for them to give, you know, 100% true feedback, right? You know, because they don't have the full information, right? And so, you know, a lot of people would say that how oh, board gives me good feedback, but the problem is board doesn't have like minute by minute situation to, you know, they have a lot of information, but, you know, so I think the big thing is the best way to think about it. What I like to do is uh, more of a listening, you know, the listening, the other point of view, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and every decision you make, you know, listening other point of view is the most important thing. And that does two things. Number one, I get to analyze that. Do I agree with that? You know, why they are disagreeing with me? And, you know, 
and then I can come to a conclusion that you know the probability of them being right versus probability of me being right, and then and if the probability of me being wrong, what are the situation has to happen, right? And so I really take a very analytical approach, you know, uh, that uh, like I'll give you an example. Recently, one of our engineers uh, uh, disagreed with few things and. And look, he had some very valid points, things that he disagreed, you know, and uh, and I listened to it. Uh, and there are a few things I agree, but there's a philosophical difference that how we want to tackle the problem, you know. And uh, so there'll be a time that where I will agree and I'll change course. And there'll be a time that I understand the decision I'm making, the consequences of the decision. You know, and I, I think it's all about boils down to the consequences, right? You know, the, 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 the ultimate outcome is the decision you make, you'll be dead wrong, you know? And sometimes, most of the times you'll be in between. And then the question is that when you make that decision and you knew you're wrong, what's the consequences of that wrong? And are you comfortable with that wrong? Because you are making a decision for an outcome, you know, and then you weigh the op probability, right? You know, uh, so that's the way I think about it, you know, uh, because, uh, the, the reality is, you know, uh, when you run an organization, there's a lot of different things that's happening. And, and a lot of the smaller things you will hear from the, probably your most junior employees, you know, because they are doing something, they're seeing something, you know, a person who is already being super successful and being in that. So I think depending on the problem, there's a dip, different truth teller, right? If there is a financing conversation or overall high level strategy conversation, you know, board is a great place to talk to or your investor. So, so it depends, you know, what, so I think, I think you cannot put them all in a one blank, one like that there's a one single individual as a truth teller. You know, I think, you know, you wanna get as much information as possible and, and, and people's opinion, how to tackle those problems. And then you have to discuss with the people on that subject matters who is expert, you know, uh, and different people are expert on different subject matters. Yeah, I mean, the key word I heard from you is just be super inquisitive and seek out that input. Because when you're at the top, I think people are naturally a little shy or reluctant to give you the hard truth. And I've also found, though, if you really ask for people to hit you between the eyes, they'll, they'll usually do it as long okay. as you do it with the right spirit. So those are very, very good lessons that you've taught us today. Um, listen, I, I got on Bear Shop uh, Sunday night. Uh, thank you. I felt like I was 31 years old again. So thank you for that experience. Mm -hmm. um, it made me feel cool to be on that website. Uh, and I'm sorry I wasn't on the app. I promise you I will make that transition now that I'm a, I'm a veteran. Uh, I did order four or five items. Uh, I ordered a shirt that said super. And mm -hmm. I was going to wear it today because you're so super. Um, the one observation, two couple observations I would make about your business that I, I was just really curious about. One is uh, someone described to me the difference between being happy and joyful. Happy is a reaction to something that was good, you know, in your life or it's, it's a reaction. Uh, being joyful is like a state of mind and something that you actually give to people uh, irrespective of circumstance or what's happening in your life. And um, one compliment I would give you about your website is that somehow you made, you, you made a very joyful experience. Thank you. Uh, and I'm curious where that comes from and how you did that. Uh, the second question uh, is, I'm curious, how much of your business model was built to be more friendly to what you call your uh, digitally, digitally native, uh, native brands? Uh, like Icebreaker, I kind of dig. There's some other brands that I found on the web. Um, but how much of your business model was built to be um, joyful for vendors and uh, not so cutthroat like Amazon has maybe become for, for the brands and the artisans behind those brands versus the consumer? And I, you're probably going to say both, but you know, when I look at the e-commerce the e market, uh, I would hate to be selling into Amazon. It would scare me to death because like in, in six months, they could be like 90% customer concentration and I'd be in deep trouble. So give us a sense of how you created joy on your website. And, and also as it relates to your business model, how you look at the difference between your value proposition for the brands and, 
and the consumer? Yeah, so the joy part, you know, I cannot take any credit. Uh, it's really a combination of uh, work between our product designer. Uh, she's wonderful, uh, Jessica, and uh, our creative design team, Eugene, and 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 the, and the kind of brands that we bring in, you know. Uh, so I, they get deserve all the credit. You know, it's all come together. Uh, with regards to, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, with regards to. Uh, so I think the the big thing what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem. You know, our our vision is to make shopping fun for everyone. You know, and when you say shopping fun for everyone, you know, it's it's consumers and it's also the brand. And I think you know, uh, and it you raised a really important question because uh, you know when I was an analyst, I used to criticize eBay because eBay was a company that in my mind at that time, I, it's not a reflection of today, but at that time that was confused who their customer is, whether it's consumer or whether it's seller. Uh, so this is something really, really important question that you raised. I think about the world as an ecosystem, you know, and, and if you're an ecosystem and if you live in an ecosystem and half of the ecosystem participants are unhappy and the other half is happy, the unhappy people will make the other parts unhappy as well, you know? So, so you can really build an ecosystem where both every participant is actually happy, you know, uh, because unhappiness, you know, uh, and 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 if or if if a group of people are suffering, that suffers ultimately spreads, you know, the resentment spread throughout the organization and throughout the you know, society, you know. So, so you have to build an ecosystem that where both can survive very, very well. You know, it's, it's a really, really important lesson. You know, when you're building, if you run a politicians, you have to do that. If you are running a company, you have to do that. If you have a family, you have to make sure everybody in the family who is participant. If you have three kids and one kid is, you know, you know, becoming challenging, it has impact on other kids too, right? So you have to make sure that you bring everybody together. You know, you, you have to carry everybody. You can't just focus on one thing. Uh, so, so that's what we're trying to do is build an ecosystem. And, uh, and, 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 and to me, it's like that if our customers are happy and they're getting the best deal, you know, and they are getting, they're finding the cool, coolest product, they will recommend our site, they will recommend our vendors, and that will drive join us for the brand. And at the same time, we have to help our brands to be successful. It's not taking every penny from them, you know, how to help, help them to tell their story. Because what is a brand? A brand is a promise, right? And, you know, every brand has a story to say. And if you let them tell the story, you know, then they will be successful. So the question is, how can you create a storytelling opportunity? And again, we have a lot of work to do that on that, to be completely honest, and that's where we're working. Uh, and then let that story and, and, and bring the customers happy so that when they shop, it brings joy to their life, you know, because uh, so that's that, that's the problem we're trying to solve. That's so cool, uh, especially for those of us who are kind of bored with Amazon uh, and worried about their dominance, really. Yeah, um, and, look, and Amazon. I, mean, Imran, I, 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 I always like it when, when we when we do interviews and I could just rapid fire questions. Um, with one or two word answers, whatever, um, just to get as much out of you uh, here at the last three to five minutes that we possibly can. Um, so is it okay if I just sort of machine gun you with uh, questions? Sure. Okay, favorite book? Uh, favorite book, uh, you know, the book called The Prize, it's by Daniel Jurgen. It's, it's talk about the oil industry. It goes back to the last hundred years. It's a, it's, it's a fascinating book, the how oil industry developed worldwide. Uh, the Prize, written by Daniel Jurgen. Thank you. Favorite podcast? Oh, I don't listen to podcasts, unfortunately, so I'll punt on it. <laughs> Have you ever been on a podcast? Uh, I don't think so, to be honest with you. I, 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 I dodge those podcasts. And, uh, I know it's very popular, but, you know. Oh, I like. I, I think there's going to be a lot of people from Denver Startup Week that will want to hear part two of this. So, uh, highly encourage you to share your wisdom if you can. There's some just great platforms out there. Um, uh, going a little deeper, like leadership quality you most admire in, in in either colleagues or other leaders you've met in your time. People who are kind. Okay. Uh, leadership quality you wish you had more of, and why? Uh, I would, you know, 
I think one area that I could work more is uh, how can I make people more comfortable around me all the time? You know, I think that's the biggest challenge as you are, you know, become CEO or founder that, you know, people are you know, always very, you know, cautious what they're going to tell you, right? They're not always being very get... in front of you. So the question is, how can people, you know, tell me the things that they will tell their colleagues so that I can get full information? Thank you. Um, uh, you probably, you may not want to answer this because you'll, 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 you'll inevitably miss somebody, but favorite leader, uh, either that you've worked with uh, or, or, or aware of and why? Who's your, wh who's one of your role models? Uh, I actually r really, you know, I didn't work with him that closely. I had a limited exposure, but I'm actually really inspired by uh, Jack Ma, you know, how uh, the cultural phenomenon he created in the company and, uh, and how, you know, uh, he set the great examples, right? You know, he, he, and 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 then he truly built a truly partnership culture. You know, I think one of the things there's a there's a most companies that became very very successful. You know, it's a single leader or dual leader company. You know, it's the company evolves around one human being, and you know, in a way, Alibaba does. But but you know, but but he truly built a true partnership inside the organization and the, the 27 partners that they talk about. And I think you know that's really inspiring that how can you build an organization that people who help you become successful, they're truly your partners. Last question, you've got 30 seconds. What advice, open-ended question uh, to all those entrepreneurs that are listening and watching today uh, who are battling their, their businesses and, and hopefully doing so with a lot of joy. What advice would you give us all, Imran, in so many words? I'll repeat what I said before, today is difficult. Tomorrow will be more difficult, but the day after tomorrow will be beautiful. You know, it's not mine. A mentor of mine used to tell me, but this is great. Well, and today's been beautiful, and uh, we've enjoyed your mind and your heart, and uh, we'll be rooting for you loudly here from Denver as you build your business. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. Welcome back, Denver Startup Week. What an amazing conversation. Uh, um, it's always a blessing. Uh, never realize how um, both humbling and awesome it is to see um, two friends and mentors um, rap on the most important thing uh, that, we all, that we all are here to learn about, which is leadership, entrepreneurship. And I think I loved Imran's quote, um, you know, to be kind. And when I think about some of the takeaways from today, um, Imran said early on, love what you do, have a high degree of conviction, and make sure you have the ability to create followers. As we're building companies out there in Denver, um, we, we, we hope we can continue to bring amazing wisdom. And Imran Khan, we wish you a tremendous amount of success with all things Verishop and everything that you do. And uh, as a graduate of the University of Denver, um, I, I know you always refer to this place as a cow town. We've grown up and it's gotten I really don't. fancy. I here. never do that. <laughs> that is a misrepresentation. <laughs> well, we welcome, we welcome you anytime. And, I love and, Denver. And as Vera Shopping fans, we'd love to, love to have you here. And Ryan, uh, amazing job today um, moderating the panel. Uh, you're an exemplar leader in our community. Um, thank you for all the things you've done for all things startup innovation, being an investor, uh, supporting and building the Commons on Champa. And, and uh, being here and gracing us with your leadership, your wisdom and your, and your words uh, for Denver Startup Week. Um, the, we're not done. We still have a few hours left in Denver Startup Week, almost a day and a half. Um, this evening we have Jenny Fleiss um, from Rent the Runway, who's gonna be giving a keynote speech at 5.30. Um, really excited for her to be able to uh, engage with all of us and give us some final inspiration. Um, we've got a new closing party after that, uh, a virtual startup bash per se. Um, an entirely new experience in virtual networking and celebration for all things Denver and all things startup. And uh, tune in tomorrow for all of our final sessions. We hope this week has been incredibly awesome as we're in this new crazy world. Uh, the team has worked really hard with the Downtown Denver Partnership and all of our sponsors to bring this to reality and really create the best free virtual business and entrepreneurship event in the world. We're happy to report we have over 10,000 attendees across 235 sessions that have tuned in throughout the week. 
and we couldn't be more honored to, to help you grow the business of the future right here in our awesome city. Imran Khan, thank you again. Um, best of wishes and really appreciate you taking and making the time uh, to make this Denver Startup Week just that much better. Right. Looking forward to being in Denver soon. Thanks, Imran.